Thanks very much, Nerali and Orla, for organising today. It's a great idea, and for bringing it all together, thanks very much. I'm delighted to be a part of it. Okay, I would like to begin with a story about a video game. Imagine this. Two little people are swimming for the coast of a little island. Actually, they're more drowning than swimming, and you have to save them. These little people will become your followers, but first, they need your help. You can save your followers from drowning by sculpting the land, literally stretching it out over across the sea. As a creator, you can sculpt the land. And by doing this, you can save your followers. The two humans climb onto dry land. They hold hands, the stereotypical gesture of two people in love, and they hug each other. Then they start to worship you by kneeling down, bowing forward, and flinging their arms up in the air. Your followers are safe. They now see you as their god. This is the beginning of a game called Godos. It is a typical world-building video game developed in 2013 by the independent gaming company 22 Cans. Have a quick look here at the promotional video. I've learnt that anyone can be a god, so long as someone believes in them. My journey started with these two devoted followers. They looked up to me for nurture and inspiration as they developed their lives. I could sculpt and mould every inch of this beautiful landscape using only my touch. As I've grown in power, so has their civilization thrived. I've watched my adoring followers as they've lived and learned and loved, and enriched their lives as they progress through the ages of humanity. However, the path has not been without difficulties. At times it has been challenging, but I've had the power to prevail. I discovered world building games during the first lockdown when I started reading this book here. It's called Gaming and the Divine, a new systematic theology of video games by a Dutch theologian, Frank Bozeman. And it is a fascinating read about the many crossovers between theology and the world of virtual gaming, as well as an excellent interdisciplinary work on gaming as itself a contemporary site of contextual theology. But let me go back to the world of goddess and world building games. The player here is given dominion over the world game, over the game world and its inhabitants. The ability to sculpt landscape and to, and to landscape the land and to form the future of their followers as they choose. The people in the game, your followers, they thrive and produce plenty of children, evolving to new levels of civilization, all controlled stimulated and even forced by the player. Everything in this game happens according to the player's will. And what does not is easily corrected by their almightiness. The player helps their followers to evolve, keeps them safe from harm, but at a price. Their unconditional and everlasting devotion. If the player of Godos has succeeded in saving the first two followers, they will then travel in search of a place to settle. A notification will pop up on the screen. They seem to be searching for a promised land. The first couple of places that they discover do not suffice and are turned down by your now enlightened and picky followers. And since the game is still in tutorial mode, the player's power is relatively limited. They are looking for a place to call home, reads a second notification. The player 
or gamer helps the two followers by sculpting land for them, flattening hills and making passages through the sea. Eventually, they arrive at the centre of what appears to be a very large island. This looks promising. Your followers love this land, reads another notification. They will now settle, build abodes to live in and have plenty of children. Congratulations. It is the dawn of a new people. I've just described to you the first half an hour or so of this game, Goddess, which, as I said, is a virtual world-building game. Now, not all world-building games have these kinds of explicit religious overtones. Games like Minecraft or series like Age of Empires, Star Citizen, and the hugely popular The Sims place the player in the same kind of creator slash influencer view. But games like Goddess invoke strong religious and even theological language to refer to the work of the gamer. The followers are worshipping. The player, the gamer, the creator is sculpting, shaping, saving, and even there is language of redemption. These world building games have come to be known in the gaming community as God games, not games not God as a gamer, but the gamer as a God, if you like. And narrowly speaking, a God game is a video game in which players assume an explicitly divine role in the emergent growth and development of a simulated life system. But more broadly speaking, God games share some characteristics with these other video games genres such as real-time strategy games and simulation games in which players construct and manage the emergent growth of other systems, such as cities, civilizations, neighborhoods, and even nations. One gaming theologian analyzing Goddess notes that the primary act, I'm quoting, the primary act of God in the book of Genesis is not one of harmony and unity, but interestingly enough, it is an act of separation. God separates things out, objects and entities from one another, light from darkness day from night, dry land from water. And why? To make order where chaos was. And this too is the role of the gamer of Goddess. They create their own virtual world. So why am I talking about video games? Well, one of the things we do here in theology at Carroll College is we encourage our students to not only think about theology and keep it in the head, but to actually do it to get a feel for it, and to begin to experience what it is like to think theologically about life. Last semester, while we were all working and teaching and learning virtually, I explored the idea of creating one's own virtual world with the first year theology students. And we did so while reading extracts from the Spiritual Exercises, a 15th century text by Ignatius of Loyola of which the overlap with contemporary psychology is well documented. And it was an eye-opening interdisciplinary exploration of age-old questions in two completely different media, a 15th century guide, spiritual guide, and a 21st century video game. The gamer of Goddess and the explorer of the spiritual exercises, it turns out, have an awful lot in common. In his exercises, Ignatius stimulates his reader, who is a seeker, a pilgrim, or somebody on a journey of discovery to contemplate and see the world and everything in it as a witness of its own origin, including oneself. The gamer, too, is a seeker. In order to keep the game alive, has to have an open and receptive mind to understand the true nature and complexity of things. The pediatrician and psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott may well have been onto something in his theory on playing, when he argues that playing, which cannot be disassociated from creativity and a sense of enjoyment, is an intensely real experience that has an intrinsic therapeutic value. That is to say, it is capable of promoting self-healing. 
the conversation, the, the cora between theology and gaming falls under the concept of con cultural theology, which emerged in the second half of the 20th century quite strongly alongside other contextual theologies. And these are theologies that originate from and for certain ethnic, be they social or other, uh, marginalized groups who argue that the regular theological debates are dominated by white males from Western universities and ecclesiastical organizations. So I'm thinking, for example, of queer theology, black and African-American theology, feminist theology, to name a few. All cultural theologies have some similarities in that they try to break through the perceived dogmatism that is often incorrectly associated with genuine theological inquiry, and at the same time, while adopting a more inclusive attitude towards multiculturalism, scientific progress, and modern media. Contextual theologies are convinced that God's revelation does not stop at the gates of ecclesiastical institutions or traditional theological doctrinal arguments. It is craftier than that. To quote Thomas Aquinas, who is the patron saint of theology, everything that is received is received in the mode of the knower. So this is just a short introduction to some of the topics we discuss in theology here in Carroll College. Um, thank you very much for your time. And if you'd like to know more about it, do drop me an email and I'd happily meet you for a chat. Thanks very much.